Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. Psalm 73 verses 24 to 26 read, With your counsel you will guide me, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Tim Sturby comes to sing, He's the hand on my shoulder. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions. We search the scriptures in order to find the answers from God's holy word. Question number one, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, but the change seemed to be partial and not absolute. Why? There are numerous instances through the scriptures, both Old Testament and New, of new names being given to various individuals. Abram became Abraham, Sarai became Sarah, Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles. And so this is not anything new to us that Jacob's name would be changed to Israel. And we go to Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28 for the, for the reference. 
And this is repeated or restated once again in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 10. God says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob, the name that he was given at birth, means supplanter or deceiver, one who grasps the heel. It is not a complementary name. Israel is means having power with God, a much more to be desired name for sure. And there was the change from the one to the other. But even in the immediate context, as soon as God says, look, your name is now Israel rather than Jacob, the text goes on immediately to say, now Jacob did this and Jacob said that and, and repeatedly through the scriptures, we have, though not exclusively, we have Jacob continuing to be referred to as Jacob. Two possibilities, for this is a bit of a, a quandary for us, two possibilities. He is no longer known by the definition of his name, Deceiver, because we read and see in the out, in the, in the, story of Jacob, that he is no longer the old man that he was. There has been a change. Yes, his hip has been put out of place, and from that point on, he limps as he moves around, but there has been a change. He has deceived, he has supplanted, he has grasped the heel of his brother, of his father-in-law, of his, of his kin repeatedly, even of his father. But now there is a change of heart. And so he is no longer known by that definition. Secondly, he is not known merely by the name Jacob, but also by the name Israel. Each and every one of us, and the Apostle Paul does a wonderful job of this in Romans, in Ephesians, and elsewhere, he takes us who are children of God he takes us back and he reminds us of what God has done for us. Now, some would, people would say, well, look, you, you shouldn't dwell on the past and you should just forget about all that stuff in the past and just move on and rejoice. But it's good for us to remember the work of God and where he has brought us from and where he has brought us to that our joy might increase, and that we might have all the more confidence that what God has begun, he will finish, that God has done a great work and he will continue to do a great work in us. And so it is with Jacob that he was truly a deceiver, but no longer, but he continued to be known as Jacob as a reminder of his past and what God had made him in the grace of God, and he was leading him on as someone who had been mighty before the Lord. Question number two. Heard a song on the radio, something about rivers of Babylon. Is that from the Bible? Yes, indeed it is. Psalm 137 is where you need to open your Bible. And it is the first four verses. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There our captives demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the response, how, oh, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? This is a psalm of deep anguish, a, a, a cry of lament. Verses 7 to 9, I would especially note you, they're, they're, not in, they're not included in that popular song that you hear on the radio and elsewhere. Verses 7 to 9 are a bit of a strange one, and I, I understand why they might not want to put it in a popular song. They're a little bit uncomfortable. They speak out of anger and rage about what had been done to the Jewish people. And I would leave it for you that 
the, these final verses speak of the extent of the anguish and rage of what had taken place. But note that the psalmist, he does the right thing in bringing that anger, bringing that pain, bringing that anguish and, and rage. Where does he take it? He doesn't go out and do his own thing. He brings it to the Lord. Can I do that? When I'm frustrated, when I'm mad, can I bring that to the Lord? Yes, you can. That is the best place. And God will help put that in context and he'll help you to understand that he is working all things for your good. And there is nothing that happens to you except that it is under his control. So bring it to the Lord. Let God be the judge and let him be the one to settle accounts. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. Our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Heidi Taves now comes to sing Under His Wings. Tears are a language. It's a song, but it's also the title of this new CD from the Faith to Live By singers. 
It contains solos, duets, trios, the male quartet, as well as the full group singing a couple of times. 14 songs, you will be blessed. We would be glad to send you a copy. And as all, with all of our resources, this is sent free in postage paid simply upon your request. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Or give us a call on our toll-free phone, 1-833-367-3867. Also, our website, faithtoliveby.ca, has a means of you contacting us, and we would be so glad to hear from you. Terry and Tim Sturby now team up singing, No One Ever Cared For Me, Like Jesus, and this is from this new CD, Tears Are a Language. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul, turning from the theological underpinning which he has laid out in the first three chapters and moving into the practical outworking, he pleads with the believers in Ephesus and roundabout, saying, I, the, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. This is a strong word. It is not simply, I make a weak request of you. I would really like it if you would listen to me and do this. 
I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. We need to ask the question again, what is that calling that we have been called with? We have been called with a high and holy calling. It is a privilege to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ, though this world disdains us, though this world would ridicule us as a bunch of lump heads, as those who have their heads in the sand and don't know anything at all. It is a privilege to take up our cross and to follow after him who has those nails imprinted in his hands and has that wound in his side that we might press on to glory and that we might dwell with him for all eternity. Paul says, I implore you, I beg of you, I beg of you to walk in a manner worthy. The believers in the Corinthian church especially, they are well remembered from the first century as those who did not walk in a manner worthy. They were fractious, they were contentious, they were argumentative, they were one upman on each other. But Paul, he says, this is not the way it ought to be. And he implores, he begs of these that they would have their eyes open to what privilege they have entered into and that they have been called not to be slugs crawling along the ground, but that they stand up and that they realize the privilege that has been granted to them. Now we drop down to verse 14, about halfway through this fourth chapter, and I want to especially consider verses 14, 15, and 16. Just before this, the Apostle Paul has spoken about how that we are moving, we are being called and pressed by the gifts that God, God has given us in Christ, gifts such as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We are being led and being equipped that we might be mature and that we might come to the fullness of the measure of the stature which belongs to Christ. Now, Paul says, as a result, whenever you hear words like that in the scriptures or you hear a therefore, you need to always know what you are building upon. I've just told you that. Verse 14, as a result, we're moving forward. Christ is leading us forward. He is paying the bill that we might go forward. He is strengthening us and empowering us. Paul says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Always interested that here in the first century, within just a few short years of Christ being there in Galilee, there in Jerusalem, speaking to the people and dying upon Calvary's cross, that the devil had spread a, pl a plethora. He had spread a multitude of deceptions to throw the gospel off track. And Paul, he identifies these and he says, look, my dear brothers and sisters, we are not to be children. We are not to believe every tale that we hear. We're not to believe everyone who comes with a loud voice and with a persuasive story. We are to hold to the word of God. As a result of what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, we are not to be children, but tossed here and there, but we are speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up. I remember many times as a youngster, perhaps it was one of my siblings, Perhaps it was uh, someone else round about me. And I had done something foolish. And they would say, Jim, grow up. This is essentially what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Ephesians. 
Dear brothers and sisters, grow up. Now, I would often hear it with a sarcastic tone. I don't believe that Paul is saying that. I, he's simply imploring, he is pleading. He knows that there are so many deceptions and he knows that the devil would want it above anything in order to throw these believers off of their faith. But he says, we speak the truth and we speak it in love. There is a way to do that. Often people fall off one or one side or the other. Either they're all love or it's all bombastic truth. There is a right and a proper wedding of those two together. That the truth be spoken in a winsome way, that it be spoken with a passion, but that it be spoken with a passion of love for the hearer. And Paul says, Speaking the truth in love, we are, as a result, to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Christ is the head of the church. He is the one who has purchased us with his own blood, and he is the one whom we are following after. And then verse 16, from whom, from Christ, from whom the whole body, the whole body, the church, the church of the living God, being fitted and held together what, by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself in building up of itself in love, in love. There is to be a love one for another within the body of Christ. Dear friend, let me ask you this. Peter, as he was concluding his letter, he said that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. Are you growing as a believer? Or are you still a babe in Christ? A great challenge the apostle puts to us that we grow and Peter chimes in saying, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But for those of you who don't know Christ, I bid you to come today to Calvary and to confess your sin and to look to him who died there for you, paying your sin debt and no life in him. But then don't stop there. There is much more that he has for you that you grow to know him better, to rejoice in him, and to pursue holiness each and every day. And may God's blessing be upon you each and every day. There's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6.